Aloha and welcome to our Word of Life radio program here in wonderful Okinawa, Japan. We give glory to the Lord. You know, last week we began a series. The title of that series is called Seven Strong. Can you say that? Seven Strong. Because we're talking from uh, Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 9, excuse me, verse 1, where it says, Wisdom has built her house. Wisdom has set up its seven pillars. We're talking about seven redemptive truths, seven biblical, non-negotiable truths that you must have in your life to be a strong Christian. But these seven things are not only what makes you strong, it will help you to protect what God's deposit on the inside of you. And God has done incredible things. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's something great inside of you. <laughs> Amen. And so it's important that you and I understand. Now, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. But that very verse says that not only God wants to build us, say, I am the church. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are the church. Say, we are the church. God's victorious church. High five your neighbor and say, you're still looking amazing. I don't know what happened, but I'm liking it. But it says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. But the gates, but, but I want you to understand, a, the word gates means authorities. But how will try to prevail against me, against you, against us. So, but he says, I'm going to give you things that we're going to build you up, make you strong. Amen. Say, I'm strong. Now, remember, Paul said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord. I like how it says it in the Amplified Bible. It says, be strong in the Lord, be empowered uh, through your union with him. Draw your strength um, from him, that strength that his boundless might provides. Say provides. So I want you to hear this, that there's not something you're begging God to give you. It's something he's already provided for you. God wants you strong. Now, when I talk about building up your life, your house, uh, your Christian walk. I'm talking about your temple here. Because, you know, if, if you're married and you're, let's just say your husband is referred to men because I is one, you know, I'm not debating it anymore. I just want you to understand that. So the thing is this, if I'm going to be strong for my family, I have got to be strong. I know I got to have that strength in me to be strong for, for Pastor Kuna and for my children. And regardless Oh, what happens? I have got to have strength. Every one of you in this room, we're going to learn some non-negotiable strength that sometimes we assume that because we hear words that we understand what we're talking about. And so Jesus spoke about the strength of a man or a woman or a person in Luke eleven twenty one. We read it last week. It says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions, you know, are safe. One translation says, are in peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. And so I want you to hear that seven strong is about developing this, this seven pillars into your life. Pillar number one last week was, you know, we talked about the supply. Everyone say the supply. Yeah, we talked about it from the book of Philippians, how Paul was very confident, though he was in prison, he realized that, that the supply came through prayer, so our emphasis is really on prayer. We just finished seven days of prayer in all of our campuses. Come on, give everybody a great big hand clap. Hey, that was weak. That was weak. It's all right, but uh, we'll, we'll receive it anyway. And so this next pillar is a, a, a pillar that, pillar number two of seven strong this morning, is one that, Oh, I would say every Christian has heard, probably you even heard this, this phrase prior for you becoming a Christian, actually. In fact, you probably used it, you know, this phrase a lot more than, uh, than uh, you probably realize, not in the best context always. But there's a reason for that. And uh, the reason is because the adversary does everything he can to mock this next pillar. He'll do everything to dilute this next pillar, to debunk its power, the power that it actually has. And, you know, 
I call it the spirit of the world. You'll always hear the spirit of the world giving this next pillar no reverence, no honor, and trying to push it out of every person's life. And um, the battle right now is we have the, 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 the spirit of God represented by the church, you know, uh, worldwide, no matter where it is, as long as they're honoring the blood of Jesus, the cross of Calvary, come on, somebody. But I want you to realize there is a battle going on. And there's a reason why you're seeing things contested in Christianity today. Trying to take, you know, God out of, out of our educational system. And politics are now speaking up aggressively. And, you know, some of our corporate uh, fields of endeavor are reducing down what they call religious talk, you know. And, um, but it's interesting about this one particular characteristic. The spirit of the world, which is demonic, deliberately disregards and abuses and tramples over this next pillar. And, um, but the church praises, uses, and triumphantly overcomes with this next pillar. And so what I'm trying to get you to understand, the adversary would want you to be desensitized and unfortunately, I have seen in my few travels that I've been privileged to have, you know, uh, a, a church uh, demean this very truth where they use it selectively or they don't use it confidently and um, almost as if we're crippled. But the church isn't crippled. You know, the church is very strong and um, and it's. Primarily because if you're a new Christian, you're going to hear the understanding of this foundationally this morning. If you're a seasoned Christian, I say that respectfully, you're going to hear familiar terms. But let us not think that familiarity is mastery. You know, sometimes people think that because I'm familiar with something, I've already mastered that something. And, um, and it's very dangerous. Uh, to sometimes when it comes to what I'm about to share with you because really Satan he is threatened by this next pillar <clears throat> and so um, and so is every demon and uh, it is how the church possesses its power how it overcomes in life and how it's meant to live so the first pillar was the, the, the supply referring to prayer the second pillar is very simple it is the name. And would say the name. And I'm referring to the name of Jesus. It would say the name of Jesus. And uh, <clears throat> would you put your hands together for our praise and worship team that just did an incredible job on that. It's anointed. It had an ointment on it. Now, knowing about the name of Jesus, which I'm very familiar in our circles here and in broader circles, circles called the church, we, we know about the name. And you have to be careful with listening to what I'm about to share with you, lest you close off and not open up to what God is trying to get to you. And that is, remember, the spirit of familiarity, familiarity is a religious spirit. It's a spirit that tries to get you to check out before God can check in. And I want you to understand that God wants you to get a hold of something. But here, Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name. It would say the name. Notice it doesn't say a name. It says the name. If you have a Bible, some of you ought to bring out that page stuff. Remember the Bible had pages in it? It's the name. The name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus. At the name of who? At the name of whom? At the name of whom? What's that name? Yeah. The name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven, those on the earth, those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, this is not talking about this name is just exalted amongst religious, spiritual type people. So it's not a it's not a a name that is above every name because it's a religious name. Jesus is far from religion. It's not just a positional name. You know, it is a name that rules and carries 
power and authority for you and I. You know, when Jesus said, I will give you in Luke 10, 19, he says, I will give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Stop and think about that. Hurt may try to come. But hurt cannot overtake you if you understand that you have been given authority to trample over serpents. How many of you know Jesus is not into collecting snakes or is he after insects called scorpion? He's not. He's talking about principalities and powers. He's talking about demon powers. You know that thing that comes and tries to show up on your shoulder called depression and oppression and sickness and disease and the spirit of rebellion. You hear what I'm saying? That kind of spirit needs to be evicted, taking authority over. You need to understand that you don't have to tolerate that demon power that's trying to come against you. And you need to understand that he says, I have given you the authority. Well, how did he give it to us? Well, the Gospels is revealing to us. Jesus has given us insights. He's discipling his 12 on how they're going to live their life once he goes back to the Father, just as if he was right there with them all the time. And what we're learning today, and I'm just going to hurry this up, is he's going to show them that he has given them what's called the power of attorney to use his name and to write in his name power, to write checks out, so to speak, and, and using his name where God will cash in or bring the answers or bless. And so I want you to understand that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Cancer will bow. Depression will bow. Divorce will bow. Rebellion will bow. Come on, somebody. Sin will bow. Come on. Poverty will bow. Lack will bow. Come on, somebody. See, some of us, we think like, no, no, no. We kind of have to kind of put up with this. You don't have to put up with nothing. You have the name that is above all names. And I want you to realize the reason why we, we know some things and we use them religiously. God never formed you to be religious. He formed you to be powerful. Let me show you. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that according to the working of God's mighty power, verse 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. Far, verse 21, far above. Everyone say far above. Say it again, please. Again, please. It says far above all principalities, power, my dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So not only in the things that have been revealed to human life, but those that have popped up, or those things that might come up. Well, we just found a new disease. There's nothing new under the sun. I'm here to tell you the name of Jesus always has authority over every sickness and disease. Or now you need to understand that the power of that name is exercised when you and I learn to apply faith. Knowing about something is not operating in something. And I had to learn this lesson, you know, in my life. Because like maybe many of you or some of you in this room, I went years as a young Christian knowing about the name of Jesus. See, I, I grew up in the church, so I always heard about Jesus. Every now and then you'd hear about the name of Jesus, but with no emphasis and, and, and no understanding. So, you know, when I crossed over, when I, when I received the Lord into my heart, that was an amazing thing, a miracle in itself. But I want you to understand, I didn't understand what the Bible said. And so for many years, I even began to learn in good Christian churches about the name of Jesus, but I didn't see the power demonstrated in my life. And there was a lot of stuff, you know, that I had a right to be free from, but I wasn't free from it. Oh, got quiet in this holy place. Because, see, the thing is this. It's one thing when you're a young Christian and you're learning about this. Another thing when you're a familiar Christian and you know how to maneuver in and out of church circles because you got the jargon down, but it doesn't make you free. There's a lot of people that come to church that aren't free at all, period. They know how to go in and sit down. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Jealousy's all over them. Envy's all over them. You know, they got a, they got a, they got a serpent, they got a serpent's tongue on them. I mean, they cynical, they backbite, they do all kinds of wicked things and they think they're okay. But I want you to realize 
they don't understand you know, really a relationship. So we don't just want to know about Jesus. We want to live. We don't want to be religious. We want to be free. And Jesus is the only one that can set you free. And if you want to be free, you got to be open to the Holy Ghost. And he, you got to let him rotor-rooter you where you don't want to be rotor-rootered. Yeah, he goes deep. Keep it. I remember being in California. I was a young Christian. And, uh, and I was going to what's called the Eagle's Nest Church with Gary, uh, Gary Greenwald. And he was just an awesome guy. And so, sorry, pastor. And uh, he really tutored Kuhn and I and really helped us in a lot of things. And don't have those stories to go through right now. But except to say that we would have intercessory prayer like we just did for seven days. And every Tuesday night we'd come together and we'd begin to pray with just a group of us. Of a church of thousands, there were only maybe about 15 to 20 people that would regularly come to intercessory prayer. Yeah, well, anyways. And, uh, but we would pray and I, that's where I learned how to pray and what to pray and how to stay focused. Well, anyways, I began to get an insight of uh, the name of Jesus and one day from our intercessory prayer because when you pray that way you got to do something with what you're praying you know so we started going out into the streets and somebody you know one of my friends he, he you know he said go you know I think we just I think we just ought to take the name of Jesus to Hollywood Boulevard I said but that's an hour and a half almost two hours away he said so I said, so it is, you know, so we pray, we go down there, we were using, you know, and I, I remember beginning to see the name of Jesus. I'm going to explain to you the reality of what began to happen as we took, you know, the gospel to the streets and went to places. Of course, there are people in Orange County that we could have ministered to, but you know, he just had to thus say it, the Lord. So I want you to understand that, that when I was so excited at beginning to understand not only the, the knowledge of the name of Jesus and where you can find the Bible, but the application of the name of Jesus. In other words, how we saw the disciples begin to use it and how we saw the disciples. And one of the things I learned is that the, the power in the name requires faith. It just requires faith. You know, it's not just knowledge, not just information. Information, you've heard me say many times, is not revelation. And inspiration is not transformation. But the name of Jesus, having a revelation, ought to transform your outlook against any attack that would come your way. And, um, and to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, um, in Acts chapter 3, sorry, in Acts chapter 3, there's a story. I'm not going to, it's called, um, the man gave beautiful, uh, John and Peter go to, they're going to prayer one morning, and there's a crippled man there, and that's where, remember you've heard this before, or you've read it. If you haven't read it, you will read it. And where uh, Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I do have, I give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And I want you to understand, he said, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. You know, I believe the name of Jesus is key to you rising up and walking physically, spiritually, in your family, emotionally, you know, financially, in every area of your endeavor in ministry. You cannot walk the way God wants you to walk, fulfill what God wants you to fulfill without the name of Jesus. See, the name of Jesus is the key to bringing strength into your life. Without it, you will never be the father you could have been. You'll never be the mother you could have been. You'll never be the parent. You'll never be the uh, the skilled person who, if you were like cleaving on to your skill factor, you know, you got to cleave more to the name of Jesus here. Because I'm here to tell you, there is a day when um, a situation might arise in your life. You're going to want to have a revelation of the name of Jesus not long. That's why when people, things happen to them, they don't even think about the name of Jesus. It's religion to them. And then I would have to speak even about this church. You know, it can happen and it has happened to, to people. And that's why we come back to the seven, uh, seven strong. We're coming about to foundational truths that are not non-negotiable because of pastor art. Are you kidding me? You know, it's not about pastor art or word of life. People will get you to do that. That's Believe that way. But that's just religion talking to you. 
That's poison trying to get into you. But I want you to realize, you know, when they saw, the story is in Acts chapter 3, they saw this man who had been crippled, you know, finally stand to his feet and began to rise and walk, you know, and uh, all of a sudden, people tried to give, you know, John and Peter all the credit. They started trying to name them gods, you know. They're special. And, and Peter stood up and he said, you know, it's not our godliness. It's not our power that has made this man walk at all. And in verse 16, it says, very, very powerful verse of Scripture. The same story goes all the way through. And he says, in verse 16, and his name, referring to the name of Jesus, and Jesus' name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. You want to know how you and I are going to stun the world around us? How we're going to be a living epistle known and read by all, name, by all, by all people, by all men? By cleaving to the redemptive truth that you have, the name of Jesus. Here it says, and his name, his name through faith in his name has made this man strong. See, his name is what will make you strong spiritually. His name is what will make you strong emotionally. His name is what will break every chain, get you out of every prison, set you free like you have never been. His name will bring the peace you've been looking for. His name will make you strong with joy. His name will make you strong in hope. His name will raise you up. You will be a testament to people who have known you all their lives, and they're going to have to say, I have to say there's something different about about you you just have to say it is called the name of jesus not only do i have it but i have faith in it and it raised me up when everyone gave up on me when everyone cast me to the side that name raised me up come on somebody get excited for the king and i think it's important that you and i understand and i wish i can really give you more about that i'm just trying to give you an overview here this morning and it's important that you and I, as the story goes on, you know, if the religious leaders, you know, you know, began to call them extremists. The Pharisees and religious leaders try to shut them down and try to clam them up and try to say, you know, you know, we're going to release you, but you can't preach in that name. And one other person said, you know, says, well, you know, well, by what power, by what name are you doing all these miracles? And, um, and in verse 12 of Acts chapter 4, I believe, it says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we may be saved. Now, salvation comes only through the name of Jesus. Amen? Let me help you understand just a little bit. That's why I want to encourage you, encourage you, encourage you, all of you here in this room, you know, whether you've gone through an encounter, whether you've gone through a pre-encounter, you need to go through destiny training classes. We will take these simple principles and expand it because you have to understand this. Because it's not just a, a Sunday morning lesson. I'm giving you kind of like an overlay of something that has to be deep inside of you. And uh, this is like an, an anchor for your Christian walk. And God wants you to be confident and the enemy doesn't. And so, you know, if you're born again, if you're born again, not just going to a church, but if you're born again, you belong to Jesus. Say, I belong to Jesus. Yeah, and, and that means you're, you've been redeemed and that you are destined to live a powerful life. There's no question about that. But I understand that some of us who hear those words question, where is the power in my life? That's what I'm here to share with you, seven strong, okay? And so... Uh, so you're a joint heir with Christ right now, and you have a covenant together with him. And you have been given the right to use his name. He's given you what's called the power of attorney to use his name on earth. Now, some of us know those terms. Some of us, uh, you may be a lawyer, you obviously know that term. Or some of you have read up and you know a little bit about that. But that means you have the right to use someone else's name as if that person were you. They've given you permission and legal right to use their name 
you know, uh, to write out. Well, let me give you an idea. Kuna and I, when we were first married, she was a lion. She was a lion. But, uh, her. <laughs> Lioness. Yeah. And, uh, and I was a Sepulveda. And as much as we loved each other, and as much as we knew about each other, and as much as we cared about each other, there had to be what's called a marriage. And when we got married, we made a covenant. It's why it's called a holy matrimony. All right? And in that covenant, you know, we, we uh, dedicated ourselves to God. We dedicated ourselves to each other. And, um, and we set that in motion. But what that set in motion is called a covenant. Can you say covenant? covenant. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual, binding, legal you know, God ordained, God overseen partnership. So when they asked her, you know, her name, she didn't say, My name is Rochelle Kakuna Okala Sylvia Lyons. No, she said, My name is Rochelle Kakuna Okala Sylvia Sepulveda. She got my name. And you know what that name gave her the authority to write out checks? And the women love that. And she writes checks with no reservation. And, and she has as much right, do you know, to sign those checks as I do. But that's the kind of confidence God wants you to have in using the name of Jesus. Amen? See? You've been named after him. He's given you his name. And his name carries authority as if he's right here with you he said in john 16 and that day you're not going to ask me anything anymore but you're going to ask my father as if i was with you in my name and they're probably saying no 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 you were always asking the father and getting insight from him. no no he says in that day you will ask the father in my name and he will give it to you and uh, and your joy will be made full and so he's talking about it's as if you know, I'm right here with you, but I'm going to give you the power of attorney to use my name, and you can go straight to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in any time of your need. And God, the Father, the creator of the universe, who swung this whole thing that you and I think we understand but don't even comprehend in a manini way what God has done is saying, you, I, we, regardless of where you were born, have access to the creator of the universe in and by the name of Jesus Christ. And when he hears you and I say, Father, in the name of Jesus, all of heaven gives attention because there's only a certain breed of people called the blood bought of the redeemed that can ever use that name on this earth. And you and I called the church can do that. Come on, somebody say thank you, Jesus, for the name. See, now it's important that you understand we have faith in the name of Jesus, but faith doesn't come from the name of Jesus. Remember what the word says in Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you use the name of Jesus, what do you get? You get power in the name of Jesus. You use the name of Jesus in faith, and that's what brings the power on the scene. See, you only know to use the name because of what the word says. But because of what the word says, you use the name, and the power shows up. Now, that's what I wanted you to, to get a hold of you. The name of Jesus came in three ways. I'm just going to give you the outline. It came by inheritance. It came by bestowal, and it came by conquest. Jesus went through all three of those. When he completed all of that, the day that he was begotten, the day he rose from the dead, it was, it was um, he inherited that name. It was bestowed upon him, and he conquered the principalities and the powers. And he said this. Remember, he says, all authority has been given unto me by my Father. Therefore, go ye with that authority. And I want you to understand that right now, you and I have amazing conquering authority. Now, I want to close with two more thoughts. And then I'm going to pray here. Because God always confirms his word with signs flowing. Amen. I want you to understand. 
Every name that is named, everything that's filtering the back of your head, everything you've ever had a challenge with, everything that you think you're having a challenge with, you know, the name of Jesus is the conquering um, pillar that we're talking about. You have to understand the power of the name. And, you know, we have to go into uh, the difference between praying in the name of Jesus and commanding in the name of Jesus. Or two different, two different effects. When you're, when you're dealing with demonic forces, you don't ask them if they'd like to go. You tell them, go. You don't have to justify anything. He already knows who you are. You got to know who you are. The devil already knows that you're the blood bought of the redeemed. He already knows who has the right to use that name. And so the name of Jesus, you know, means salvation. And in the Old Testament, there is um, an abundance of teaching on uh, the meaning of God's names. His names stand for his attributes. You know, in other words, like, for example, when he would reveal himself um, as healing somebody, they call him Jehovah Rapha, right? When he would provide um, supernaturally, <coughs> financially, or in other ways, they call him Jehovah Jireh. Uh, when the, uh, when a, a banner of victory would come through, they call him, um, what is it, somebody help me, uh, that, that, that one. And so... Um, and so the thing is, what I want you to understand is, is his nature and his will are revealed in all the Old Testament names. So you have, for example, Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Jehovah Shalom, which means the Lord is your peace. Jehovah Nise, which is the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, a fourth one would be Jehovah Rapha. We just mentioned that uh, the Lord who heals me or heals. Jehovah Shama, the Lord is there. Oh, man, ever-present might. Uh, Jehovah who sanctifies. Now, there are other inferences, for example, um, but I want you to hear this. All the different Old Testament names for God have been summed up and are in one New Testament single name, the name of Jesus. All of that that you see parted out, you know, and, and told in story form for our clarity is summed up in one name in the New Testament, the name of Jesus. Jesus is not part-time Savior. You know, I, I don't do healing anymore. You know, I don't bring peace anymore. You know, I'm not into the joy factor anymore. You know, um, I, I'm not providing this week because, you know, we're kind of low on funds. You know what I'm saying? It's, and I want you to understand because the name of Jesus, Yeshua, in Hebrew means salvation. And this salvation includes all that God has ever revealed himself to be and ever he said himself who he was. Everything he's ever said about himself, mighty, powerful, warrior, all of that, peace, joy, all of that in the Old Testament, as you see it, laid out in stories, is summed up in the name of of Jesus and that name belongs to you now now the enemy doesn't want you to know that because if you ever have faith in the power of that name there is no demon that can stay on you around you or in your midst because you say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth I rebuke that foul demon of defeat that spirit of failure that spirit of rebellion that spirit of discord I take authority in the name when you say the name of Jesus every demon of the dam has to tremble because there is authority it's not you it's him when you use his name it's not who you are it's who he is that threatens the adversary he understands that you and I carry come on somebody the name that is above every name and it's important that you and I understand this and I sort of get ready to wrap up and Luke chapter 9 take time to read that out for yourselves from verse 1 through verse 19, but Jesus calls and empowers his 12 to go out and to cast out, you know, devils. Now, listen, listen, if you're kind of, uh, listen, this is why you come to Word of Life, to learn the Bible. And if what I say you cannot find in the Bible, you don't, you're not obligated to believe by any means. But I will say this, if you think you're living in a time and a season 
where it's all about being culturally relevant. And there are no demon powers. That's a thing of the past. But you are living in a sad, sad world. And I guarantee you that's why you're sad. We mask it over. We try to get through. But you don't have to live sad. And you don't have to live mad. You can live glad. <laughs> because the Bible says that Jesus called together the 12 and gave them power and authority, you know, uh, over all demons and to cure diseased diseases. And he sent them out, you know, to announce or to preach the kingdom of God and to bring healing in every area of life, not just physical healing, healing in every area of life. Well, they went out and they came back. And in verse 17, it says here something very important. This is Luke chapter 9. And it says, and then the 70 returned with joy. Say joy. Say joy. And they, this is what they said. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They didn't go in the name of Peter. They didn't go in the name of Pastor Art. They didn't go in the name of Word of Life. They didn't go in the name of John. They didn't go in the name of James. They went in the name of Jesus. Which tells you here that he said, when I empower you, and you confront anything that opposes the gospel, anything that opposes the kingdom of God, use my name. Because they came back with the testimony of what? Using his name. And this is what it says in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, it says, those that believe in me, in my name, they shall cast out demons. They shall speak in other tongues. It goes on to say some other things, but it says they shall lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Not in your name. Not in the name of your denomination. The name of your favorite preacher. But in the name of Jesus. I said the name of Jesus. Say the name of Jesus. Now a lot of people know about it, but don't have a revelation of it. Therefore, they don't have no power. In it. And so we want to get the power. Let me tell you where we lose the power since you asked the question. Because I think it's important. You know, exercising our authority in the name of Jesus begins with honor and with reverence. Where there is no honor, there is no power. Where there is no reverence, there is no presence. One of the things that the church has lost is reverence and honor. As a principle, they dishonor authority, myself. They dishonor one another. We dishonor God's word. We have no reverence for it. Yet, when it, we come in times of need, we want it to have par be powerful for us. It doesn't work that way. If you don't have a spirit of honor and reverence, you'll never have his presence nor his power in your life. It does because you are, we are, the church is, I am as well as you. We are in a world that is trying to desensitize you and depower. Is that a word? I just made it up. Latinos will use it. Anyways, uh, will depower, <clears throat> you know, the power of the name. But there's an Old Testament verse that has New Testament relevance. And it's taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 20. Verse 7, in the King James Version, it goes up on the screen. It says, you shall not take the, Lord, the, the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, for the majority of us, um, you know, we would say, I, I would never take the Lord's name in vain. I don't use the Lord's name and then add a four-letter word to it. <clears throat> And um, although that may be, might be so, let, let's examine some things. Years ago, um, I heard Joyce Meyer speak on uh, along these lines and uh, really helped me. But it allowed me to see when I was asking for a greater revelation of the name of Jesus that um, I had developed some bad habits. And these habits were developed because of the culture I'm in. 
You know, we're, we're very, you know, today, we're 21st century, very hip happening. You know, we want to stay relevant, want to stay cool, want to stay hip. We want to keep up with the latest little, you know, talk, especially, you know, when it comes to social media, you know. And, um, <clears throat> and there's nothing wrong with that, in essence. But you have to be careful because you cross a line. When you cross a line, crossing the line doesn't necessarily just hurt others. It will ultimately deteriorate your conviction. And so the, the, the word vain <coughs> means useless, uh, bearing no fruit, um, to no avail, or foolishly, or uh, irreverent. In other words, with dishonor. And in the Amplified Bible of Exodus 20, verse 7, it says on the screen, it says, You shall not use or repeat the name of the Lord your God in vain. That is, lightly or frivolously, it's hard for a Latino to say, frivolously in false affirmations or profanely. Now, let's look at this word lightly. Now, let me, let me share with you about me, not about you. I'm not saying this to you. I'm saying this about me. Okay? So please understand that. And, uh, but <clears throat> I found myself really being corrected by God in areas. When you want greater understanding about something, he'll give it to you, but he'll also show you whatever he wants to show you. In my particular case, he was showing me a bad habit that I had bought into and that all of you would say there's nothing really wrong with it. It's fine. For you, it's not for me. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. You know, and uh, you can even get into deception and irreverence. And, uh, for example, for me, it was a habit of saying, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then we do it, you know, and then we add some shocking something or something surprising, you know, when we drop something. OMG. In me, in my case, it wasn't my gosh or my goodness. It was, oh, my God, in my case. I'm not yours. Maybe you're not even here. You're cool. You're Just chill. Then have your lemonade and just drink it right there, and then I'll get back to it. You know? No, no, seriously. Okay? It doesn't fit. But, but Christians do this innocently, thinking that they're calling up, you know, and using the name. But it's, it's frivolous. It's light. There's no intent, purpose, drive, passion behind it. You know, and, uh, you know, OMG, you know, you know, it, you know, we, we say, or we say, Jesus helped them. You know, we get, there's a lot of religious little connotations. Jesus helped them. Oh, my God, they need Jesus, don't they? You know, we're just, we're just playing with our friends, right? We do all of them, you know, we do the donut, whatever, and then we do the moves and we do the jerks and we do, Jesus, somebody help that person. You know, you're not, you're not really asking for Jesus to help that person. You're making a statement to your friend and it's in conversation, all right? And now there's nothing inherently wrong with that, or is there? Because when you lose reverence for the name, I used to have a person who actually brought me to the Lord, and, and uh, this person, you know, very spirit-filled, really serious, but I remember walking with her and Pastor Kuna and the Alma Moana, she said, you know, Pastor Arcuna, watch this. And she'd walk up to the automatic door. She goes, in the name of Jesus. And, you know, of course, the doors would open automatically, right? And I'd laugh. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But I felt something very uneasy. And I even pointed it out. And she says, oh, come on. You don't have to be that serious. You know, and, and I get it. And I really don't have to be. And it wasn't about her. It was more about me. For me, for my life, it was crossing the line. For me, for you, you know, if the Lord doesn't speak, that's fine. You're not going to find chapter and verse where he says, please do not say OMG. <laughs> In terms of, oh, my God. Okay, you might say, oh, my gosh, all I ever meant was, oh, my goodness. That's, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with OMG. Don't please, if you hear somebody say OMG, say, oh, my gosh, I heard about people like you. No, don't go there. Oh, please, I'm going to have to lay hands on you to refrain you. But I, I want you to understand that. And we uh, see the name of Jesus is the only power I have. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto you. 
When cancer is trying to riddle your body or divorce is trying to come against you or the spirit of rebellion is working through your children or the, the, the spirit of murder or anguish and you need power, you expect Pastor Art or any other pastor or minister of the gospel, not just pastors, to have a conviction about what they're doing. Good morning. Koichi speaking. おはようございます。コイチです。How is your today's message from Hawaii? And、uh, Pastor Art s p e a k about、uh, the name. The name means、uh, Jesus Christ. So I would like to explain next few minutes in Japanese to a Japanese listener. おはようございます。えー、今日ハワイの方から届いているメッセージは「名前」というメッセージが来ていますその名前はイエス・キリストの名前ということです、えー、先週から「七つの柱」というタイトルで、えー、8回に分けてお話を進めていきますけれども先週は「す、え、べ、ー、ての供給元はイエス・キリストでありますということをお話をいたしましたで今週はそのイエス・キリストの名前がどれだけの力があるのかということを、えー、ハワイのパスタートは皆さんにお話をしています中身といたしましてはイエス・キリストの名前はすべての名前のその上にありますよというふうにまず言っていますそしてそのイエス・キリストの名前を使うとすべての領域でその力が働きますよというふうに話していますでその意味はイエス・キリスト三位一体の神はいつの時も権威でありますよということですですのでもし今毎日の生活の中で経済的に厳しい状況であったり家庭の中で問題が起きていたり病気で日々の生活を送るのがつらいまた気分が優れない鬱であるというような、えー、状況があるのであればイエス・キリストの名前で祈ることでそれがすべて癒される。問題が解消されていきますよということを話しています。In this morning, and the pastor art preach us, and Jesus' name is the Almighty Power. If we are in a struggle and as a sickness and the finances problem and the family problem. Any other problem we have, shall we pray for Jesus' name? And last week, Pastor Art preached me God g i v e us an unconditional love, and God has a plan for our life, each of us, each of us. So, his name lights us up. この朝、もし、神が私たちに何かを伝えたいというふうに考えているのであれば、まずは先週話した内容を少し思い出してください。イエス・キリストを信じたときには、無条件の愛が私たちに与えられるということを先週お話をしましたそして神は私たち一人一人の人生にその計画を持っていますよということですですので私たちが今イエス・キリストを自分の人生に迎え入れて
神の計画に沿って生きていくのであれば多くの祝福を受け取ることができるということです。So, I would like to recommend you have to receive Jesus Christ in your life. If you do not receive yet, because Bible said when you receive a Jesus Christ, God bless us, bless you. Every second, every day, every week, and the whole area on our life. 今、神様がこの沖縄の地に住んでいる一人一人の上に本当に神の愛を降り注ぎたいというふうに。思っているように感じますその神様の愛は本当に無条件の愛ですので何かと引き換えにその愛をもらえるとかお金を神に捧げたからその愛をもらえるというものではありません。神の愛は全てが先にいいただけるととうことですですのでもし今あなたの人生の中で本当に無条件の愛をいただくいただきたいというふうに思うのであればこの時をぜひ逃さないでください。Please, please listen carefully.God loves you every second, every time. Every situation. If you are in sin, it doesn't matter. God loves you. Please receive Jesus Christ in this morning and please receive His plan on your life. So I would like to pray for you. Every situation, finances and the family problem and the sickness, and in this morning, especially cancer and、uh, finances and the family problem and the depress, I pray for you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. We trust you. Jesus, you are El Shaddai. You are healer. You heal us in this morning. Thank you, Jesus. You are provider. And you are, you deliver us every problem on our life. Thank you, Jesus. Kami Sama, ありがとうございます Kono Asa, Watash Tachi, Ga. 持っている経済的な問題やがんの問題や気分が優れないうつの問題や家庭の中に取り巻く多くの問題をあなたの見舞いに持ってまいりますあなたは備え主であなたは癒し主であなたは解決を図る神様ですからありがとうございますこの朝私たちがそのような問題にあることをあなたは十分にご存知ですからその解決策をいただきそれをすでに適用されていることを感謝しますありがとうございます神様感謝してイエス・キリストの皆によってお祈りいたします And one more And could you receive Jesus Christ I pray for you a salvation Please repeat after me And dear heaven father I am a sinner right now I repent my sin and I receive your son Jesus Christ who has died for my sin. Dear Jesus, come into my heart and my life. I will trust you and save us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you, Jesus. 感謝します。どうぞ
この朝イエス・キリストを迎えたいという方がいらっしゃれば今からお祈りすることを繰り返しお祈りしてください神様感謝します私は罪人ですこの時に私はその罪を悔い改めてあなたを私の心の内に迎え入れることをこの朝宣言しますそしてあなたは私の助け主となって私はあなたを信頼して毎日を生きていくことを信じて口で告白します。主よ感謝しますありがとうございます。イエス・キリストの皆によってお祈りをいたします。Thank you for listening everybody in this morning. And today This is a new day for your life. This is a new season for your life. Please, please enjoy your life. Next new one. ありがとうございます。主よ。感謝して、次の一週間を良き一週間で過ごせるように、イエス・キリストの身によってお祈りいたします。アーメン。See you next week. また来週お会いしましょう。